Welcome, everyone, to the On Poly Podcast. I'm Steve Pakin. And I'm John Michael McRae. Today on the pod, Ontario has unveiled its budget, and it's a biggie. Lots of spending and a much bigger deficit. We'll break down the numbers. We also know who will be running for the Ontario Liberals in the Milton by-election. Spoiler alert, it's not the Liberal leader. No, it isn't. And in your column, my column, there are thousands of line items in the Ontario budget. But I'll focus on just one that really grinds my gears. And I will break down what the government is and isn't doing on housing. It's Thursday, March 28th, 2024. So let's get to it. Hey, partner. Hello. That was a fun day uh, earlier this week, eh? Uh, yeah, you know, budget day is always exciting. Budget day is exciting. It's a good day. It's the biggest day on the, on the, I guess, on the political calendar at Queen's Park every year. Uh, outside of an election day, absolutely. Absolutely <laughs> right, right. Now, I was thinking, actually, I don't know, I shouldn't be promoting the competition here, and I'm going to change subjects on you very quickly. Do you watch this new Law & Order Toronto show that's on, I forget what channel it's on, but it's on another channel? Uh, I, I have not caught it. I am more of a, a classic Law & Order, like a Michael Moriarty era. Oh, that's going way back. Yeah. You yeah. weren't alive when that started. I, yeah, it was, uh, not maybe not when it started, but certainly uh, <laughs> I caught it in reruns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, got it, got it. Um, I remember, I interviewed him here for Studio 2, Michael okay. Moriarty. Yeah, he was a very interesting guy. And I did my impression of... Um, who was the DA then? I forget what his name was, but he always used to say, settle it, settle it, make it go away. And when I did that for him, he got very impressed. Oh, very That's nice. my one impression, I guess. <laughs> my one impression. I do happen to know from our producer that there's a recent episode where someone was stealing cars by forging details at the Toronto Department of Motor Vehicles. They they didn't actually call it uh, Service Ontario, but that's what they would be referring to. Now, did this actually happen? Uh, it did uh, last yeah. year, and I, I have to wonder whether the episode was written before or after that. I mean, they have a good history of like tracking the headlines. They do. No, a lot of the stories are plucked from the headlines, but they always yes. hasten to add, uh, you know, it, it's not completely 100% true. Yes. I, you know, I, I raised this because I was wondering the other day, what would they do on a Law and Order Queen's Park <laughs> edition? <laughs> I wonder. Uh, I mean, to stay with the theme of the week, I, one of the, the worst things you could do or one of the biggest sins in political life would be uh, releasing the details of a budget before uh, the embargo has lifted. We always get very stern warnings about that. Definitely a faux pas. They really, they, they really read us the riot act on that. Right? Like we go into this lockup. And they say, basically, if you divulge any details of the budget before the minister gets up in his place in the House at 4.05 p.m. Eastern Time and starts reading the budget, we will, what do they say? I think we'll, 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 we'll come to your house and kill your whole family or something like that. Anyway, it's, it's stark. Yeah, I mean, and this year was a relatively light touch. Um, you know, we were allowed to move between the legislature and the the building that they had us all uh, working in. Uh, in prior years, I mean, I remember my first budget lockup being shocked at like OPP officers like patrolling the halls and maybe watching you. They weren't going to follow you into the bathroom, but they, they were definitely watching you. They escorted you to the bathroom. That's yeah. exactly right. To make sure that you were not secreting budget document papers yeah. to the bathroom and somehow calling them into somebody else. Anyway, it's uh, it's all a bit ridiculous. Now, we should do just 20 seconds here, 20 seconds, because I know people will be disappointed if we don't refer to what we're wearing here. <laughs> and I like this simply That's because... Good. You know, in, in, as we've talked in the past, in northwestern Ontario, they call it a camp. Yes. In the rest of the province, they call it a cottage. So camp cottage? Okay. This is Ontario's version of the two solitudes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Now, I don't know what a... What's an... Is an axolotl? Axolotl. So, uh, you know, we had our, our TVO telethon uh, last weekend, and the um, the theme was curiosity. And so I happen to have this shirt, which is uh, Never Stop Wondering Axolotl Questions. Um, an axolotl is an amphibious uh, uh, animal. I believe it's native to Mexico. Uh, my kid happens to be kind of wild about axolotls. <laughs> and so I picked up this T-shirt at some point, and it's, I think it goes very well with the theme of curiosity. It does indeed. <laughs> Shall we get to it? Absolutely. Let's get to it. Here comes issue one. This past Tuesday, Finance Minister Peter bethlen Falvey unveiled the province's annual budget. It is a plan to spend $214.5 billion and includes deep deficits over the next two fiscal cycles. Now, of course, we did a budget show on Tuesday of this week, and we don't want to do the same thing all over again. So we are going to spend some time on some of the items that didn't get so much coverage earlier in this week. And JMM, let's start with healthcare. 
Right, so this is always the biggest line item in the provincial budget. Um, and yet, uh, this is kind of an odd year uh, that we are coming into, the uh, 2024 uh, fiscal year. Uh, they are projecting to spend only $500 million more on health care. That's a 1.3% uh, increase. You know, normal years, it's it's totally ordinary to see health care spending tick up by a billion or two or more, mm. just as the sort of natural course of things. So only a half million dollars more is half a billion more. A, a half a billion dollars. Mm. Pardon me. Yes, five hundred million. Uh, that that's unusual. Um, it, for I think the first time in this government's history, the increase in spending for healthcare is actually less than the increase in spending for education. Uh, I, th that struck me when uh, I, I saw that. And it, they have, they really are ratcheting some of the the healthcare spending. They are uh, including $9 million of money for uh, planning uh, the, the early works for a new medical school uh, in at York University. Um, we got a bit of news, or we got a, a hint about the, that this was coming uh, before the budget was uh, formally announced, but the school will be focused on uh, training family practitioners, try to help address the uh, shortage of family doctors. Um, and they also announced uh, money for uh, new family health teams, something uh, they say will help connect 600,000 people to family doctors, uh, people who currently lack uh, family doctors. That's undoubtedly good news for the 600,000 people. Uh, Ontario's family doctors estimate 2.3 million people are without family doctors. So making a dent maybe, but not much more than a dent in that shortage. It would be good if they could get that medical school open Yesterday. Yeah, or Unf a year ago. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it's going to be a while still. But yes, when it gets up and rolling, uh, hopefully that'll be able to do something about the GP shortage in this province. Yes. Um, okay, there are some other concerning numbers in the budget as well, because the economy, as the Treasurer told us, is starting to soften. So what else should we bring to the fore here? Right, and we should really you know, put this in the context of the, um, the, the Bank of Canada's interest rate increases and the, the slowing economic growth, uh, basically... Uh, Income tax, sales tax revenue, uh, these are all way down. These are sort of the, the mainstays of provincial uh, public finance. And so the government had been project projecting a, a $200 million surplus uh, this year when they did their last budget a year ago. Uh, that is uh, now in 2024 going to be uh, a $9.8 billion deficit. You already mentioned that uh, at the top of the, the show that this is a very large deficit, a $10 billion swing in the province's uh, finances. That is uh, obviously not what Peter Bethlen Falvey uh, would have uh, preferred to see. You know, there are lots of items in the budget which indicate how the economy is performing. You pointed out personal income tax revenue, corporate tax revenue. Those all indicate how well the economy is doing. There are always two or three lines that I look at that also give you an indication. One is booze sales. <laughs> and if you'll notice, like they almost always go up year over year, right? The LCBO remits to the province of Ontario $2.5 billion or something every year. They're anticipating less revenue to the Treasury in this upcoming fiscal year compared to last year. Why? Because the economy is going down and they figure people are going to have less disposable income to buy booze. You know the other one that's going down? Cannabis. Okay, exactly. <laughs> yes. The Ontario Cannabis Store. Tokes, as I like to call it yes. for short. <laughs> also expecting less revenue from that. So And yet gambling revenue projected to go up. And gambling going up, yes. yes. Lottery and gambling going to go up. So yep. as the economy gets worse... People go to casinos and try to drown well, and their also sorrows. the explosion of sports gambling, I suspect, is yeah. something we're seeing a lot of there. That's true, too. Yes. And, uh, you know, you want to talk bad numbers. I think some of the most disturbing numbers in the budget were, as a result of the federal government putting the cap on international students, uh, there are now going to be many fewer coming here. And, well, put... Show us what the numbers look like in terms of the lost revenue to the post-secondary sector. Right. So uh, Ontario's colleges and universities uh, are expected to see revenues decline by $1.4 billion this year and then another $1.7 billion in 2025. Yikes. So almost $4 billion uh, in the whole. That money ultimately has to be made up uh, by the government or not at all, right? We could just see universities simply cut services. Which they uh, surely will. They'll yes, have to. Yes. Um, I, again, unless the government uh, makes them whole. Um, but I, I, I don't think I, I would be speculating too much here to say that uh, the, the government uh, is, is not going to suddenly write a blank check for the university sector. Has shown no signs of being prepared to do that. Yeah. Absolutely fair to say. Uh, there are also uh, some uh, additional costs. These are uh, 
somewhat related to the post-secondary, but much uh, broader public sector costs there. Uh, the government is, is still uh, factoring in some increases in spending from uh, the uh, their decision not to appeal Bill 124 to the Supreme Court. They have simply accepted the uh, Court of Appeals ruling that that law was unconstitutional. That has financial effects, uh, billions of dollars more that the government is uh, paying in compensation. Whenever Bill 124 comes up, we always mention that, yes, it did apply to us uh, here at TVO, and then we like to move on quickly. <laughs> um, but it, the total cost to the Treasury is expected to be $6 billion. It might actually be higher, but that's what the government is disclosing. In future years, they are simply going to count it as base spending, and we aren't going to get those costs broken out in future budgets. Now, we know it is the job of the opposition to oppose, so you will not be surprised to hear that the NDP leader, leader of the official opposition, Marit Stiles, Liberal leader Bonnie Crombie, Green Party leader Mike Schreiner, none of them was particularly impressed with the budget for all of their own particular reasons. So let's hear a little bit from them and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. Nothing that the government laid out today helps hardworking people breathe a sigh of relief or gives them confidence that what's causing them stress matters to their government. Doug Ford and his Minister of Finance have chosen to do nothing for you. This is a do-nothing budget. It's not even worth the paper it's written on. This is budget no. Budget no leaves far too many people behind. People are struggling. They deserve better. They deserve a budget that says yes to solving the challenges the people of this province face. Now, as I was saying earlier, you and I and many other journalists were in, I guess, what they call a technical briefing lockup before the budget was actually unveiled. And I wanted to pursue this because you, you asked the, um, the guy who was giving the briefing at the time, the Deputy Minister of Finance, about a new provision that was brought forward in this budget, which has really got very little play so far, and it was intriguing. It was interesting. And I, I'm, I'm not sure you were really thrilled with all the answers you were getting at the time. But anyway, why don't you walk us through that right now, because this is new in this budget. Yes, so... Um it, it, it was clarified for me after the, uh, the, the briefing ended, uh, but it was a, a bit of a confusing back and forth. Uh, so the government is introducing a new um, incentive to try and get purpose-built rental housing uh, built. At the moment, the way property taxes apply to rentals in Ontario is kind of a mess. Uh, the vast majority of rentals that were built prior to you know 1975 or so are taxed um, much at a much higher rate than your standard single family uh, house. Uh, they're also taxed higher than condos, right? A, a condo that is owned by an individual uh, or even, you know, owned, uh, there might be multiple owners, um, that is still taxed as a single fam family home. It's specifically purpose-built rental housing that is uh, taxed at, uh, usually at a very high rate. Uh, a few years ago, the Ontario government tried to introduce a, uh, a new multi-residential tax class. So if you built a new purpose-built rental home, it would get taxed at the same rate as the single-family home. Fairness, right? Um, what the Tories are proposing to do uh, with this new budget is create a, a new, new uh, tax class where uh, actually rental would be uh, charged a substantially lower property tax rate. Municipalities could, in theory, uh, lower the property tax rate by up to 35% hmm. relative to a single family home. So you could see that potentially being a very big incentive. Uh, probably not going to change, you know, if you've got a piece of land that is like zoned for single family homes, that's probably not going to change your calculus about what you want to build. But for people who are uh, looking at building condo towers, that kind of a difference in property taxes, they might choose to build a purpose-built rental instead of a condo tower. So to be clear, there is no obligation of the municipality to offer this lower income tax rate, but it's an option. Uh, that's correct. Uh, here is what the finance minister, Peter Bethlen Falvey, had to say specifically on that. We want to give municipalities more choices, more, more tools. They don't have that tool right now. So we want to give them that, that tool. Uh, I'd also say that uh, it will lead to, uh, the goal is to have more purpose-built rentals made, which obviously increases revenues uh, for municipalities. So I want to dwell on this for a moment, because if you listen to the government's attacks on Bonnie Crombie, uh, they are insisting that municipalities know what's best. The Premier has said mayors know best, but I guess not ex-mayors. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that... that the Premier says solutions to the housing crisis don't need to be imposed from Queen's Park. Now, 
we can debate whether the rhetoric uh, matches the, the government's record on that score. Uh, but, you know, I, I am waiting to see what the next iteration of the uh, government's uh, housing supply action plan is. They've had two or three of these now. We expect the next one uh, in coming weeks. Uh, but like a question of, you know, where does the government force municipalities to do things or take powers away from them? And where does it simply make options available? That will be something that I will be paying close attention to. Gotcha. Okay, what else caught your eye in the budget? I, I mean, this one is just sort of an interesting one that um, the uh, Ontario Provincial Police will be receiving funding to buy four new helicopters uh, to uh, aid in you know crime detection. And, and uh, I imagine that uh, this is particularly related to uh, the rate of auto thefts that have been going on, you know, all over the province, particularly in the GTA. We've heard police chiefs, uh, you know, talking about record numbers of auto thefts. And I, that feels to me like a use case where more helicopters might be welcome. Uh, you know, uh, the government is also proposing to spend $95 million over three years to uh, combat crime and specifically $50 million more for uh, uh, combating auto thefts specifically. I did note that one of the things that was missing from this budget was any increase in the Ontario Works Compensation or the Ontario Disability Support Program Compensation. Uh, why do you think no enhancement to either of those programs? Well, the government did uh, agree to uh, index the, I guess it was the ODSP to inflation in a prior budget. Um, they would say undoubtedly that, you know, that is growing the uh, program with need. Obviously, advocates uh, for uh, uh, marginalized people, people who need these services, these uh, uh, income supports, would say that it's nowhere near <laughs> sufficient. Um, you know, the, uh, the the finance minister talks a great deal about like the the competing pressures that he is under to balance the budget, but while also uh, meeting the government's priorities. They don't want uh, large new tax increases. Uh, they don't want to make painful spending cuts elsewhere. Um, so, you know, uh, something is going to get crowded out and uh, it looks like OW and ODSP would be one of the probably many things we could think about on that list. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess we could say this every year. This is the biggest spending budget in the history of the province of Ontario. I mean, you would say that every year because they never spend less, <laughs> you know, in the, the next year than they did the year before. Um, it's an historic amount of money. It's, as we suggested off the top, is north of $200 billion dollars. I seem to recall in past years, though, that the budgets were, how do I put this, bigger. <laughs> what do you think? Well, okay, so <laughs> this is the budget plan as it was presented to us. And, like, it, it is actually, like, not a very thick tome this year. Uh, certainly, I think you and I have covered budgets that were um, more substantial in, like, a literal physical sense. They weighed more. <laughs> yeah, this, this one's 200 pages. Yeah. But we've seen budget documents that have been... 400, 450 yeah, pages, absolutely. I mean, much bigger. Um, and, yeah. and at least one year, uh, uh, we were still getting inserts handed to us yeah. because, the, you know, there was stuff getting added after the, the budget had already gone to the printers. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about the, the, the physical shape of this budget, uh, and, I, and we're having a bit of fun with it, but there's, a, I think, uh, an actual point here, which is that the government is sort of in the middle of its mandate. They didn't have a great first year, if we're going to be honest, right? After the, the 2022 election, right? They, they burned a lot of time with the Greenbelt scandal. They're trying to reset things on the housing file. And at the moment, uh, it, this feels very much like a budget from a government that uh, doesn't know where it's going to be in two years, right? Are they going to have enough money to do something big and, and popular like, let's say, uh, a big tax cut or some big new spending program? Uh, we don't know, right? Uh, so this budget, to me, feels like they are treading water and they are waiting to see uh, how things develop over the next few years, right? Um, even with the projection to get the budget back into balance in 2026, which is what they are projecting. And which is an election year. It, which is an election Coincidentally year. Coincidentally enough. Um, it's the narrowest of surpluses that mm -hmm. they are projecting in 2026. And this was already, a, a, frankly, a, a, a bad news year, at least as far as the, 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 the finances go, uh, an unexpected and an unexpectedly large deficit. They just need a little bit more bad news, and they'd be really out of room to do anything big and new and 
uh, uh, vote winning mm -hmm. uh, right before an election. So, I mean, yeah, w we will see whether they run out of room before the election. Indeed. Let me throw one more thing on the table, and that is, in case you missed our budget coverage from earlier this week, uh, there was a really lovely moment in the legislature, and these don't hop... These don't happen very often, which is why I sort of wanted to just close off our coverage here with this. You know, most ministers of finance, when they stand in their place in the legislature to read the budget, they they start with a heartwarming story. They want to dedicate this budget to somebody. They want to acknowledge somebody who's in the gallery, who's been influential in their life. Most ministers of finance, or treasurers as they used to be called, uh, did this routinely. And Peter Bethlen Falvey did it this year. He got up and he started his speech and he talked about a young guy who left Eastern Europe many, many years ago, came to Canada, you know, met, established a life for himself, went to University of Toronto, got a degree, had three kids, and, and the treasurer kind of choked up at that moment. Uh, he, could, he couldn't get the words out. And he was, it was a really lovely moment. And the members of the opposition started to applaud because they saw that he was having trouble and they wanted to kind of give him cover to to get his, you know, to recompose himself, I guess. And of course, he was talking about his father, yes. his 95 year old, 94 year old father. It's a budget. I got to get the numbers right. His 94 <laughs> year old father, uh, whom he later joked with me in the interview on Tuesday night, uh, is still belting back scotches with the best of them. Uh, he's, in fact, uh, Mr. Bethlehem Falvey said, my dad can drink me under the table. So uh, for what that's worth. Anyway, it was a lovely... That we could all say the same at 94. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was a lovely reminder that even though there is a lot, there's too much, uh, you know, miserable back and forth thing and insults and bad behavior and all that, there are those moments which really stand out because sometimes people can rise to the occasion and that's good. Yeah, little moments of, of grace, and we do still get them at Queen's Park, and it's, uh, it's nice to put a spotlight on them when they happen. Amen. And with that, on to issue two. Earlier this week, the Ontario Liberal Party announced who will be running in the upcoming Milton by-election. Still not called, I don't think, right? Uh, not as of this recording. Not as of this recording. But uh, to be sure, will be happening at some point this year. And here's the spoiler alert. It's not going to be the Liberal leader, Bonnie Crombie. Galen Naidu Harris will be the Liberal candidate in that race. JMM, what do we know about him? Uh, he is the son of Indira Naidu Harris, who was the MPP for the riding of Halton, uh, as it was then called from 2014 to 2018. Halton was uh, then divided up into uh, multiple ridings, including what is now uh, Milton. Uh, she was uh, defeated in 2018, lost the seat to Parm Gill, who, of course, uh, his resignation as a, an MPP is what has sparked this by-election in the first place. Uh, Naidu Harris has lived in Milton his whole life uh, and has worked for the federal MP for Milton, Adam Van Coverden. You know the first thing that popped into my head when I heard about this candidate? What's that? You. <laughs> And I'll tell you why. Because just as I worked with your father, yes. John McGrath, and now I'm working with his son, John Michael McGrath, Indira Naidu Harris, who is this candidate's mother, yes. used to do a show here at TVO. Oh. She was an anchor here at TVO once upon a time, so I used to work with her, and now I'm covering her kid, which just goes to show you. I don't know what it goes to show it's, you. It's I, a small world. <laughs> I, I don't want to think about what it goes to show you. But um, anyway, as a reminder, uh, Naidu Harris is going to go up against Z Hamid, who is running for the Conservatives, and he is he's a bit of a controversial candidate in as much as who did he endorse in the last provincial election? Uh, that would be uh, Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca. And, and who has he given money to in the past? Uh, the Ontario Liberal Party. Yeah, so it's unusual for him to have a conservative nomination, but he is a, um, you know, he's a popular local figure, and he once ran for mayor and did really well in that mayor's race. So, um, you know, we're going to keep our eye on this because this is looking like a really good race. Now, while that is all set aside now, yes. and Bonnie Crombie's not going to be the candidate, I guess the next question becomes... Okay, leader, where are you going to plant your flag? Are you planning to actually get in the legislature before the next election happens? Or are you just going to wait for the next election? Or what? Are you hearing anything on that? No, not yet. Um, you know, the, the traditional uh, option for a party would be for one of their existing MPPs in a safe seat to resign and uh, for the leader uh, to uh, run there, uh, given how few seats the Liberals have in the legislature right now. What are right they up now. to now? They at nine? They're at nine. Mm -hmm. um, that seems unlikely. So um, 
we will see. I, 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 it's entirely possible that Bonnie Crombie will serve out the rest of this legislature without actually having a seat in it. No obligation that she get one. No, it, yeah. it, not until the next election, certainly. Yeah. Um, it would be odd if, if the party did really well, it would be odd for her to for example, be premier uh, without a seat in the legislature. <laughs> Though, of course, that's it's, also allowed. It's happened before. Yes. It's happened before. Now, not usually I say, but not in your lifetime. In this case, not even in my <laughs> lifetime. Uh, I think you got to go back. Which election was this? 1920. Oh, my gosh. It's either the 1919 election or the 1923 election. The, the United Farmers of Ontario won a majority government without a leader. He didn't have a lead, He did not have a seat. Uh, Ernest Drury was his name. And after the after the election, which they won, the party picked him to be the leader, and he went out and got himself a seat. So it's not unprecedented. Um, we should also talk about uh, Lambton Kent Middlesex because we've we've been talking about Milton a lot because of the speculation about whether Bonnie Crombie would run there, and and because of some of the other things that have been happening in that riding. But the reason we're talking about a by election being called in the near future, anyway, the 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 clock that started when. Parm Gill resigned. Uh, we, they could go months before calling that election. But they, they, they have to by June, I think. Yeah, but uh, Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, they, re, they are getting right up to the limit of where they have to uh, call the by-election soon, and that's because uh, this was the writing that former Labour Minister Monty McNaughton vacated uh, last year, and there's a, a six-month timeline, I believe. Um, as I say, we haven't discussed it as much uh, on this podcast. Uh, I think without fear of contradiction, I could say we, we kind of expect the Tories to hold on to that riding. Uh, Monty McNaughton held it for a very long time. That said, the Liberals did hold Lampton Kent Middlesex from 2003 to uh, 2011 when they lost it. Actually, sorry, I, may, I might be wrong on that. It was either 2011 or 2007 that they lost it. Um, but we, we mentioned the Liberal seat count earlier. Even in the I'm going to call it unlikely scenario where the Liberals won uh, both Milton and Lambton Kent Middlesex. Uh, they would still be one seat short of being a recognized party at Queen's Park. That is true. So. That is true. OK, let's uh, enough by election talk. We're about to do our regular feature, your column, my column. All right, this is the point in the podcast where JMM and I talk about uh, something that we wrote for TVO.org this past week. And what have you got for us? Uh, you know, Everything I wrote for the website this week is about the budget, and uh, I, I will try not to go over uh, too much of what we've already spoken about on the podcast, but I did write about uh, the the property tax stuff that uh, we mentioned at the top, but that's just one of a few things that is in the budget that is sort of broadly housing-related. Uh, there's some stuff in there about uh, changes to the non-resident uh, speculation tax and also uh, changes to rules about uh, taxing vacant homes, uh, the government saying that in a housing crisis and unused home is uh, not acceptable. So uh, if people want to learn more about that, they can go to tvo.org and uh, read about it there. How about you? I am a dog with a bone on this subject. <laughs> really and are. I appreciate, now look, uh, th this place, TVO, has been very indulgent with me over the years, allowing me to profess my interest in, you know, the Hamilton Tiger Cats or the Toronto Maple Leafs, even though we know that there are plenty of people in Ontario who don't cheer for those teams but they let me be unbiased in, in that matter. There's one item in the budget that always grinds my gears, and I don't understand it. And so when the finance minister was on the program two years ago, I asked him about it. When he was on the program last year, I asked him about it. When he was on the program on Tuesday, I asked him about it. I'm not making much progress with him, but I'm going to continue to ask him about it because every time I do, I get people emailing me saying, keep on this. This is a ridiculous, stupid policy, and you need to keep, you know, bringing it to his attention that, that the policy makes no sense. Here's what the policy is. It's that one line, one line in the Ministry of Energy's budget, which shows that taxpayers are going to spend $7.3 billion in this fiscal year subsidizing the electricity use of residents everywhere. And my point is, if you want to give people who are lower income a break on paying their hydro bills, that's great. But the government of Ontario is sending me $9 a month to help me pay my hydro bill. Yeah. And they're sending it to Peter Bethel and Falvey as well. Yeah. And they're sending it to millionaires uh, and billionaires as well. And I, I, I think I'm on solid ground on this. I don't think a billionaire needs help paying his hydro bill. No or a millionaire needs help paying her hydro bill. 
So I've been suggesting that maybe it's time to free up some of those billions of dollars instead of giving them to higher income people and direct that money to something more sensible. And for whatever reason, I have yet to be able to persuade the treasurer of the wisdom of that position. But I'm not giving up. No, it's, it's, uh, it is this enormous sum of money that the government is spending. And uh, it is part of how they have managed to uh, tame the politics of electricity in this province, right? Like the liberals... Is certainly in the last few years of their time in power, they, they really, really struggled with not so much electricity policy as the politics of it, right? It, it you know, the, the expenses really were uh, big, big, for, and and particularly that you know it, it, they hit some people very hard and and in ways that you couldn't help but notice, um, and. Uh, but the, the cost of taming the, the electricity politics in Ontario is literally billions of dollars. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it shouldn't be odd to say that maybe we could find other uses for that money. I agree. And, and, you know, I mean, the treasurer had some fun with me at my expense the other night on the program when he said, you know what the definition of insanity is, Steve? <laughs> you know, <laughs> doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. And Sorry, I am expecting a different outcome. At some, at some point, somebody's got to wake up and realize that this makes no sense to send billions of dollars to well-off people who don't need help paying their hydro bills and repurposing that money for better ideas. Yep. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox enough on that. Uh, shall we open some mail? Absolutely, let's, let's do it. Let's do that. If you've got a burning question or an insightful comment, we always love to hear them. Send it along to onpoliticsattvo.org, and we're going to start with an email from a listener named Tessa Jourdain. From Guelph, she says, Hi, I am currently on parental leave with our five-month-old. Congratulations. And like many parents, we are anticipating the challenges of finding childcare despite being on all the lists. Would you be able to provide an update or deeper dive on the rollout of $10 a day daycare in Ontario? How effectively are the funds going from the feds to the province and then to the providers? Are the funds sufficient and sustainable for the demand? Thanks very much. Love the show. Tessa. That's great. Thank you, Tessa. Okay, JMM, what do you want to tell her? Right. So uh, my my child is uh, has aged out of daycare, uh, but I, boy, do I remember those years of of you know managing those costs. Um, the Canada wide early learning and child care system uh, has lowered the cost of child care by about half in Ontario. But as uh, Tessa notes, parents are now having a tough time finding spots. Uh, with lower costs, demand for spots has gone up uh, even uh, higher than it already was. Uh, and meanwhile, the sector is struggling to retain the workers that it has, uh, particularly you, you, you know, with uh, criticism that uh, the sector really doesn't pay very competitive wages. Uh, daycare centers who did opt to sign into uh, the uh, the program with the, the, the province and federal cost sharing, uh, they agreed to cap their fees. And uh, the, the, the the problem that is besetting the, the sector right now is that uh, the between the fee cap and the provincial and federal money, uh, there's still uh, not enough money for some of these uh, some of these centers to stay open. And so some of them are simply opting out of the federal and provincial program entirely um, and going back to having extremely high fees because they say that's the only way they can keep the hmm. doors open. Well, I mean, in a little refresher course on this, because if your childcare days are behind you, mine are well behind <laughs> me. So how is the new system supposed to work? Well, so the, the province, uh, we mentioned the, the fees are capped and the province is supposed to step in and replace the money that was uh, lost from the, the fee cap. Uh, however, that cap is based on the fees that were in place in March of 2022. Uh, you may recall that uh, in 2022, uh, we just come through uh, some notable years in uh, child care policy in Ontario and daycares had, uh, in, in many cases, they had frozen their fees uh, during the pandemic. So now the costs of lots of things have gone up. Uh, I imagine in the same way that it's more expensive for the city of Toronto to, to deliver transit. And in fact, the city also delivers child care. Private child care centers are dealing with inflation as much as anybody. But because of that fee cap, they are having a hard time 
meeting their uh, expenses. Uh, daycares do receive some funding increases from the province. Uh, however, the funding increase for 2024 was just 2.1%. Uh, and the year before that, it was 2.75%, so substantially less than inflation in those years. Uh, daycares, unsurprisingly, uh, say that this isn't enough to cover their costs. And uh, some have either, either had to close rooms or close centers entirely, meaning fewer spots for new parents like Tessa. Is there a provincial role here to alleviate this problem? Uh, well, this uh, all falls under the Ministry of Education. Uh, Minister of Education Stephen Lecce has said that uh, he is asking the federal government for more money. Uh, this, of course, is a program that got started because the federal government came to the table with federal money. Uh, we have uh, cited the financial accountability officer before uh, on this podcast. Uh, according to the FAO, the province spends $146 million less on childcare uh, than it was planning to in the first three quarters of 2023 and 2024. Um, we don't have a totally clear picture from the FAO on how the, the money is flowing from the province to the daycare sector. Uh, on the daycare side of things, they are asking the province to change the funding formula so that you get to that full cost recovery so that uh, the the sectors, even with the uh, fee cap, uh, the sector is still uh, able to recoup its money. Uh, they basically would just like to be able to send the government an invoice and have it paid for. Uh, it, you know, would not be that dissimilar from uh, how we handle healthcare, right, where a doctor just says to the province, like, Here's what I did. Pay me. And the province pays. <laughs> gotcha. Tessa, I hope that helps. Here's an email from a listener now named Andrew Hunter. He's writing from Toronto and he says, hey, Steve and JMM, given that the NDP, Liberals and Green parties are all on board with fourplexes, what does Doug Ford's government stand to lose by going with where the wind is blowing? Do they fear that their core constituencies are going to defect to the Ontario or new blue parties or just sit the next election out? Sincerely, Andrew Hunter. Okay, how does that look to you? So just uh, to remind our listeners, we're talking about this because uh, the uh, Ontario uh, Liberal Party and the Liberal leader, Bonnie Crombie, have proposed legalizing uh, fourplexes and four-story buildings uh, uh, across uh, Ontario in any residential uh, parcel. Uh, the Premier has railed against this, uh, saying that, you know, Bonnie thinks she knows best, is one of the, the quotes in the, the ads that they, they used. Um, the, the premier says they will not be uh, allowing uh, fourplexes or four-story buildings. Um, two different things going on here. Uh, one is that the premier has been referring to these uh, four, uh, to the idea of four-story buildings as uh, four-story towers. Uh, I will grant that in a lot of places a four-story building would be taller than any of the surrounding homes. I, uh, hearing it referred to as a tower is kind of like nails on a chalkboard for me. I don't <laughs> think that's a really serious criticism. Um, but it is at least the case that the Liberals did propose legalizing four stories, so I can see why uh, the, the Premier has sort of dug in on that issue in particular. Uh, why he is opposing this issue uh, when, as uh, Andrew mentioned, uh, it, it has broad support from the opposition parties. Uh, I mean, part of me goes back to the issue of the 413, uh, which you know we talked about uh, during the last election. Uh, it does not, in fact, have majority support, or at least did not have majority support in some of the polls that we saw during the last election. But Doug Ford was able to get all of the people who really strongly supported the idea of building the 413 highway uh, behind his banner while all of the opponents were divided. And um, I, I think some of this is actually just genuine uh, uh, skepticism from uh, Premier Ford. He just doesn't like the idea of uh, these kinds of buildings being put in, in suburban neighborhoods. Uh, Premier Ford, of course, represents a, the suburban riding of Etobicoke North, um, although as other people have pointed out, uh, most of the uh, residents of his riding, uh, in fact, live in apartments of five or more units. Hmm. Um, all that said, uh, aside from, I think this is just a sincere belief on the, the uh, Premier's part, uh, I, I do think you could also look at uh, that, that example of, you know, Ford is quite happy to collect the minority view if it's a 40% issue that's a winning issue in uh, a first-past-the-post system. No question. If you've got 40% of the people on your side and 60% oppose you, but they're divided among three different parties, you win. That's how it works in our system. Now, it's interesting as well, politically speaking, he's really attacking the liberal leader on this one, even though Marit Stiles, the leader of the official opposition, 
has the same view on this. She's in favor of fourplexes as well, as is the Green leader. Yes. But for some reason, they seem to be not in the crosshairs of the Premier at the moment. It's the Liberal leader who's in the crosshairs. But the NDP is fully aboard this policy as well. Oh, yes. And, and you know, I think there are uh, other elements that uh, the, the NDP support that you know, you would almost expect Ford to uh, rail against even more. I mean, the, the NDP have proposed bringing a, 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 a public agency that would build more social housing in the province. Uh, the federal and provincial governments have largely gotten out of the business of uh, building dedicated public housing, um, and uh, the NDP have, have historically really argued that that was both a, a tragedy and, and helped contribute to the housing crisis we are now in. Uh, so, you know. That's just one thing that I would have expected Ford to rail against. But again, to to cite opinion polls here, you know, the last few polls we've seen, uh, the NDP are uh, trending down. Uh, they are uh, the last poll I saw. They were in third place, um, not very far behind the Liberals, but behind the Liberals. And it is possible that uh, the Tories have just decided that uh, the the Liberals are where they need to concentrate their fire right now. Okay, one final note before we go, and that is I want to circle back to an email that we got last week from somebody named Brian Lewis. Now, of course, I'm a hockey fan, so when I hear, uh, let me rephrase, I'm a hockey fan of a certain generation. <laughs> so when I hear the word, when I hear the words Brian Lewis, I immediately thought, oh, this is the guy who's the former referee in the NHL, and he also was a, a town councillor in Halton Hills as well. He was in municipal politics for a while. Turns out that the Brian Lewis that I and I know him. But he's Brian with a Y. Right. And the guy who emailed us was Brian Lewis, but it's Brian with an I. And that Brian Lewis was a chief economist and assistant deputy minister in the Office of Economic Policy in the Ministry of Finance for the province of Ontario from 2015 to 2021. And he's now a senior fellow at the Monk School at the University of Toronto. So we have resolved the mystery. It wasn't the hockey guy. It was the former bureaucrat. But now you've got to wonder if Brian with a Y is also a listener. You know, I haven't heard from him yet, but um, maybe i got to reach out to him and find out why he's not listening, because we got to get him as a listener right now. But, uh, yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to get right on okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Well, while you're working on that, I will tell our listeners that if they would like to ask about uh, any content on the show, they can please email us at onpoliticsattvo.org. Hey, you got the email right this week. I did. You I managed to, to memory finally. managed to read it this time <laughs> off the screen. <laughs> well done. Well, that is the On Poly Podcast for this Thursday, March 28th, 2024, our budget special. Uh, you can follow our show on Apple Podcasts so you get notified each time a new episode is available. And if you already follow our show, help a friend follow it too. Any feedback you have, we're always happy to hear it, good, bad, or indifferent. Write us an email at onpolitics at tvo.org. He's got it. And be sure to include your first, last name and where you're located. This week's episode was produced and edited by Matthew O'Mara, video editing by Colin Kish. Production support from Jonathan Hallowell, Christine Gardner, Vito Tagarelli, Jeff Cusera, and Jennifer DeRosa. Our managing editor is Katie O'Connor. Lori Few is the executive producer of Digital. John Ferry is vice president of programming and content. Special thanks, as always, to our crew here in the studio who make the thing look so nice when it goes on television or when you watch it on YouTube. Uh, thanks, guys. Always a pleasure. And until next Friday, everybody, we say... Bye-bye.